once I built a railroad and made it run. In 1994, I bought a house with a large garden, and in 1995, I commenced building a small 7.25 inch gauge Titch tank engine. In early 1996, I completed the engine and made a driving truck for it. And also in 1996, with help from a couple of good friends, a 7.25 inch gauge railway was laid in the garden, which ran all the way around the house. This video features a collection of old photograph negatives and some archive video of the engine and railway in action. Many years ago now, I wrote an article about the building of the railway for my website. I don't normally use a script, but in this case I'm going to make an exception. There are things in the article that I'd forgotten about a long time ago. So part of the narrative will be taken directly from the article. Here we go. Once I built a railroad and made it run. Initially, I enlisted the help of a music student friend, Chris Taylor, during the summer holidays to prepare the foundation of the track. Over the next few weeks, armed only with a spade and wheelbarrow, he visibly lost weight, especially as he dug the cutting around the back of the house. At a rough estimate, he must have moved 50 tonnes of rock, stone and soil, which was not bad for a trombone player. His other part-time job in a garden centre made it slightly cheaper for me to get the weed barrier plastic sheeting, which was to go under the ballast. His staff discount was to come in handy, as we were going to need a lot of it. 400 feet of this material was laid in position and then covered with 20 tonnes of gravel ballast. Once the ballasting was complete and Chris was looking even thinner, it was time to source the sleepers. And initially... Pricing these from a specialist supplier, the cost seemed prohibitive. The solution was to buy tannalised 4 inch by 1 inch timber from a local fencing manufacturer, who also cut them to the required length of 13 inches and treated the cut ends. When the sleepers were laid in position, the railway was beginning to take shape, now for the track, and once again the price from specialist suppliers was prohibitive for me at the time. Originally I intended to use aluminium track, but I just couldn't afford it. The type of construction chosen was the same as West Riding Small Locomotive Society's club track, which is one inch by half an inch flat mild steel bar for the rails, with one inch by eighth of an inch flat mild steel bar cut to three inch lengths for the chairs. These chairs were pre-drilled in a jig and welded in place at nine inch intervals on the rails. The welding was beyond my capabilities, and it still is, I'm a terrible welder. I did try, but I usually ended up welding the pieces of metal to the vice. Luckily, my good friend John Bolt came to the rescue. All of the welding on this railway, and believe me, there was a lot of it, was done with John and his electric glue gun, as he used to call it. And it was John who took these photographs. Recently, another friend of mine, Nigel Penn, converted the negatives into these images you see now. Not wishing to destroy too much of the garden, I decided it would be a good idea to make the railway fit in with the garden and not the other way around. This is a view down the left-hand side of the house as you look at the front. And here, by drilling and using plugs, the chairs were screwed down to the flags which in retrospect wasn't really necessary, because in the end I had the entire area down the side of the house concreted over, which held the track in place, and over the years it never moved at all. This is a view from the gateway at the side of the house, and as you can see, the track first of all bends outwards before it bends inwards to go around the garden. There was a logic to this, it was done on purpose anticipating over-speeding down the long straight. I thought that if the engine derailed, it would be better to put a reverse curve in so the derailment would throw me and the passengers onto the lawn instead of into the rockery, which has lots of rocks in it. I was quite worried about this because I've had derailments in the past. But thanks to the soft suspension on the little Titch locomotive, it never derailed at all. Sometimes I would go so fast down the side of the house that the engine would bob up and down because of the balance weights on the wheels. It's worth mentioning that I only ever went at these sort of speeds when I was driving the engine by myself. Taking a break from the railway for a moment, 
This is a shot of my workshop in 1996. It was in a double-length garage attached to the house. If you watch my videos regularly, you'll be wondering where the Boxford lathe was. Well, at this time, I hadn't bought it. In this photograph, you may recognise the lathe. It's my Smart & Brown Model 1024. I used this lathe to build the 7.25 inch gauge titch and the passenger truck in just over one year. I'm not the best engineer in the world, in fact I'm not an engineer, but I'm definitely quick. I have my obsessive personality to thank for that. You may also recognise this, it's a Nairock milling machine. Nairock is Korean, spelt backwards. And I've had this for years and it still works just as well as it did in this photograph. When I look back at these photographs, I can really see the passage of time. Currently, in the year 2023, I am 70 years old, and I really can't believe I've lasted that long. Coming up is a piece of video which is a blast from the past. It features my two youngest daughters, driving the 5-inch gauge electric Thomas the Tank engine, which I built for them when they were young. I have three daughters, and there are two of them here. The other passenger on the train is not one of my daughters, he's my friend's son. And here is my good friend Colin Green walking around the track, just making sure everything's OK. Sadly, he died a few years ago, and he's well and truly missed. The little boy is Colin's son Adam, who is far bigger than this now. The child struggling with the white hat is my daughter Charlotte. She is now 36. And here she is a few years ago, driving the steam locomotive around the house. The small Thomas the Tank engine wasn't steam, it was electric, and it would only go at one speed, which was slowly. On the workbench in the old workshop is the chassis of the driving truck. It's not a very good quality photograph, it's very dark, but you can clearly see the suspension arrangement, I wish I'd have only used one of the springs of this thickness. I built it this way because of my body weight, but it was a bit over the top, it was a very hard ride. This is testing the track. I'm sat on the passenger truck and my friend Chris is pushing me around the track. Because after digging the foundations and shoveling all that gravel, by this time it was very strong indeed. You can't really tell by the photograph how fast we were going other than the fact I'm holding on to make sure I don't fall off. We were testing the reverse curve part of the railway. In this clip, I'm checking the super elevation amount required on the curve. In order to safely hurtle around the garden at a great rate of knots, super elevation was built into the front curve. The geometry involved in this proved difficult, as we didn't have the luxury of bending rollers all bending was done by a very simple device which was like a claw with an allen bolt in the middle. You just hooked the two substantial claws on the unit over the piece of steel you wanted to bend and then tightened the allen bolt using a substantial allen key. This very slowly bent the track into shape. Every three inches. Yes, it took quite a while. We were lucky to have a long and fairly level length of garden wall on which to weld the track together. The straight sections of track were constructed in their entirety on the wall with cross ties welded in using a track gauge after every third chair. This clip shows me positioning the bending device on the rail just to show how it fitted. We didn't bend the track after it had been welded together. When we were making the straight sections it was quite simple. John welded all the parts together, and in this photograph you can see work in progress. Well, almost. John was actually taking the photograph at the time. But you get the idea of the complexity and how long it must have taken, but in reality we did it in three weekends, which was good, really. That didn't include Chris's part of the job, digging the foundations and laying the ballast. Here's an example of John's welding. He was always very good at welding, amongst other things like karate and cycling and just being John. Here I'm doing my bit. 
I'm sighting up the length of track to make sure it's straight as John welded it together. The straights were easy, it was the curves that were more difficult. Here I was in the process of checking the super elevation around the front part of the garden using a straight piece of bar. I don't want to mislead anyone into thinking that everything went smoothly and swiftly. Not only did work grind to a halt as I felt the need to run the engine after every section of track went down, but a fox ate John's welding glove, all the kneeling and bending took its toll on John's knees and back, but luckily a friend of mine, who was also one of my studio customers, called in to pick up some cassettes. He was the late Mr Harry Thompson, a professional holistic healer, he gave John a therapeutic zap, therefore allowing him to get back to work on the railway. On screen at the moment is a really good angle of the reverse curve. You can see how steep it is. Something that wedded me at the time was we didn't use any expansion joints in the railway, but it never appeared to move. And the railway was as good when I sold the house in 2019 as it was when we built it in 1996. Looking at these photographs for me is a bit of a nostalgia trip. A lot of water's gone under the bridge since these photographs were taken. Now I look quite different. This photograph was taken as I was moving the studio equipment from the studio round to the front of the house and we used the railway. In the year 2000 I helped build an extension to the house when I relocated the studio from the premises to behind the house, which seemed like a good idea. As we were building the extension, I used the passenger truck on the railway to transport all the concrete blocks from the top of the drive round to where they were needed. And the amount of weight that I put on the passenger truck was a bit of a worry, but I needn't have bothered because it didn't do any damage to either the passenger truck or the railway. And that's it for the slideshow. I'm going to finish the video with some live footage. This is taken from when my friend Alexander Carnes came to visit me. And in these clips you can see the long passenger truck. And it was great because you could lay down when you were driving the engine and look through the windows. This one features Mr Alex Carnes driving the engine round the railway. This locomotive may be small, but it has a large firebox. In this clip Alex is shoveling some coal into the boiler. And in no time at all it's ready to go. The first thing to do is to take it round to where the hose pipe is to fill up the water tank in the tender. When I built this locomotive, I didn't want to have to keep rebuilding the valve gear, and I found some ball racers which were a quarter of an inch OD and one eighth of an inch ID, and I fitted these to all of the moving links on the valve gear. And now in 2020, there's very little in the way of wear on the motion. There is some wear on the coupling rod and connecting rod bushes, but not a lot as you can hear the engine runs very sweetly. I really thought it out when I built this engine. For instance, I made sure that the expansion link was large, therefore it wouldn't wear out very quickly. Also, the engine axle boxes contain ball racers. These are shrouded and shielded and have never got any dirt in them, so they still run very freely indeed. I used to drive it flat out down this part of the railway. When I first built the railway I incorporated a reverse curve at the end of this long straight in case the engine ever did derail, in which case it would tip itself and all the passengers onto the lawn, not onto the gravel and up against the stone wall. The suspension on this engine is quite soft because I didn't want it to fall off the track and it's really worked because it's never once fallen off the track. And believe me, I've been around this track at an alarming rate of knots. I used to enjoy driving my engine around my own railway, it was quite good. But all things must pass. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found this informative. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.